board. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of SLP's Wine and Cheese. I'm Maria, and I'm sitting here virtually with Rachel Madel. Say hello, Rachel. Hey, guys. Super excited to be here. Yes. Thank you so much for being here. For, I'm so excited to have you on our podcast. So I want to tell the audience a little bit about you. Rachel Madel is a Los Angeles-based speech-language pathologist who coaches parents and professionals on how to utilize technology to support communication development in children with complex communication needs. Rachel specializes in AAC, augmentative and alternative communication, and presents to clinicians both nationally and abroad on using technology to support children with autism. When she's not working with children in her private practice, she co-hosts a weekly podcast called Talking with Tech that discusses evidence-based practices in AAC. Her work has been featured in Autism Parenting Magazine, Speech Science, Practical AAC, Exceptional Ed, Teachers with Apps, and Child Nexus. She is the founder of a digital media company, www.rachelmadel.com. That link is in the show notes that provides educational resources, therapy materials, and training videos to help support parents and professionals of children with complex communication needs. And you can follow her on social media at Rachel Madel SLP. That's all. That's your bio, Rachel. I feel like I need some drink after that, you know? Listen, let's, let's do it. I'm excited. <laughs> yeah. Cheer virtual cheers. Cheers. So tell the listeners, cheers. what are you drinking, Rachel? I'm actually drinking a, a, a margarita. So I'm like a big fan of margaritas and tequila actually. <laughs> and so I was like, you know what, here's an opportunity to really show who I am, <laughs> which is a really big lover of margaritas. Good. I'm glad that you're here to show who you are. That's what the show is about. You know, just elevating all those voices, speak up, tell us all about you. So I, on the other hand, like to drink Sauvignon Blanc. You know, I'm not as uh, I'm not as uh, hardcore as you. I don't think I'm a big tequila <laughs> person. <laughs> you know, it's so funny is that I feel like it does seem like I'm like a raging alcoholic. I tell people I love tequila <laughs> just because I feel like we all have that like story with tequila where it was like we had tequila and then things got crazy. I don't <laughs> drink it and get crazy. I just like happen to love a good margarita. So you can call me hardcore if you want to, but it's my drink of choice. Listen, I, I've it's you know, I like margaritas too at certain times, but I don't know. I think, I guess, cause I have one, like half of a glass at this point, we uh, had an interview with Jenny Biorum yesterday. So I almost drank the whole bottle and I was like, let me save it for Rachel. So I saved the rest of this Sauvignon Blanc, Kim Crawford. I really like this Sauvignon Blanc. And I was like, why not drink this? So listen, virtual cheers, whatever works. Done. Another cheers. <laughs> cheers to our drinks of choice. So Rachel, so you are joining us from California. So it's a little earlier in the daytime. So you were like, I'm, I'm going to party it up. SLP's wine and cheese time. So I have, yeah, I know I'm, I'm three hours ahead of you. Sorry. Oh. There was a lag. <laughs> oh a no. Lag in the, the zoom. No worries. I'll edit this part. So, so before we get into our interview and we're going to talk real talk about AAC, we're going to just, you know, unfilter, we're going to just be real about it. Little hiccups that happen along the way, different obstacles, but also success stories. But first I wanted to get to know you a little bit more. And we've met before at ASHA in Boston I think it, yeah, we met in Boston the first time. And then we met again in Florida, in Orlando. So we've hung out twice. So I do know you, but I want the listeners to get to know you a little bit. So I made up this little game. It's called me right now. So it's who you are in this exact moment. So aside from tequila and margaritas, what is your drink of choice? Okay. So aside from that, I love coffee. <laughs> like I'm a coffee addict. Me too. <laughs> so like I go from coffee and then I just transition to tequila. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> coffee and tequila. Great. All right. What about your book of choice? 
That's actually a really great question. Um, I'm actually reading right now uh, Tim Ferriss, Tribe of Mentors, um, which I'm really, I'm really into, you know, I have my own business, actually I have two businesses. So I'm really into entrepreneurship and I'm really fascinated by entrepreneurs who are really optimizing their businesses, optimizing their performance. Um, I think you learn a lot about yourself actually when you read books like that because you realize that people set up morning routines and they, you know, think certain ways about, you know, different decisions that you can make, um, you know, throughout an entrepreneurial journey. And I'm just fascinated by listening to kind of the success stories um, of people who have already done something and made a huge impact. Um, so right now, Tim Ferriss, Tribe of Mentors. I also have read his book, Four Hour Work Week, like years and years ago. And I was like, four hour work week, sign me up. Like I'm trying to work only four hours a week. <laughs> Obviously the book is a little, it, it, it kind of reveals that like you have to do a lot of upfront work to eventually get to, you know, only work four hours a week. But um, that was kind of like what got me really excited about this idea of online business. Um, so right now, Tim Ferriss. Okay. So you recommend his books then? Yes. He's kind of intense. So like, you need to like brace yourself. Like he's like an extreme person. Um, but I feel like if you think about kind of all of the brilliant minds out there, like most, that's kind of like a common denominator, right? It's like, they're like intense in some ways. Um, I feel like Gary V is like another like example of like intense, but like has really valuable insight. Um, so yeah, he's kind of like, like some of these people, I'm like, I don't know that I'd be their best friend because of their personality, but like there's something like that they have to share. And obviously they've had a lot of success. So I find it fascinating to, to kind of learn from people like that. Exactly. And um, I think I brought this up before, like Susie Ormond's like, she's very intense, but like she gives great advice, you know, like you can't afford that. I'm like, all right. Uh, you know, so sometimes, you're right. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You know, I make sure you have now she says like one year's uh, savings in your savings account. And if you don't have that, then you really can't afford this like other um, fee or this other expense. So just stuff like that. But yeah, these authors, they tend to be very extreme, but that's because like they are the experts in that. So they're going to give it to you like hundred percent. So even if you take like 30% of that, you still gained a lot of knowledge. So I hear you go with, go with the intensity. All right. Yeah. <laughs> How about a uh, series you've been binging series? I've been binging. I actually just got into stranger things. Ooh. So okay. Like it was like, I was late. I'm kind of a late adopter sometimes with TV shows. Same um, here. And I'm like, Oh, everyone talked about that two years ago. Like it's time for me to check it out. <laughs> uh, but stranger things. Oh my God. I love the nostalgia, right? Like, yes such a good job of like, I'm like, oh my God, I had those pop tarts when I was growing up. Like, I feel like they did such a good job of like the little details of that show, like just bringing back, like, I don't know, nostalgia from like when I was growing up. Definitely. And, uh, I don't want to have any like spoiler alerts. So what season are you up to? Did you I just started, so I'm still season oh, one. Oh, okay. So I don't want to say anything, but I could so, see, don't say anything. Okay, I'm, yeah, I'm not even going to say anything, but when you get to the end, just like message me and I'm going to be like, I could tell why uh, Rachel likes this show. You're going to like this show. Just that's all I'm going to say. That's all I'm going to say. I'm not going to give anything away. So how about another question? Most people are surprised to hear blank about me. Hmm. That's a great question. Most Thank people you. are, you know, take your time. You could take a sip, you could take some margarita, yeah. you know, you know what this reminds me of Maria. I feel like at Asha, I had, I interviewed you for my podcast and we talked about slowing down and I was like, I just like to do double time speed. And you're like, you know what? I like to just take my time. <laughs> So you and my brother are like the two people I know that listen to podcasts at like 1.5. And I've tried, I've tried, but like, I really feel like I'm missing half the information. So I'm like, this is, I'm not even comprehending this. Like, this is like, I got auditory processing. Like this is way too fast for me, but I mean, go more power to you. Yeah, but. I know. It's like, it's interesting. I'm like trying to consume as much content as possible in a short amount of time. I feel like that says a lot about my personality. <laughs> okay. So what the question was, wait, what was the question? It was people will be surprised to know this about me. Yes. Um, that's a great question. Um, 
I think that this isn't, this is going to be, isn't going to be succinctly worded, but I feel like a lot of times people um, are surprised at like what, like a um, kind of fierce business owner I am and like business person. Um, Cause I think that like oftentimes as SLPs, when we're in business, it's like, we're, we're trying to help people. And like, and I am trying to help a lot of people. That's like what drives my business. Um, but I'm also like, you know, all about like business, right? Like if we're not making money from what we're doing, then like it really isn't a business. And so yeah. I think that that's something that surprises people when they meet me um, is like, wow, like, sh- like I'm like going through contracts and like renegotiating them and saying like, I don't like this language, like you need to fix it or I'm not signing it. So like things like that, I think probably surprise people about me. Um, so I don't know. I think that that's probably one thing that even like, especially people outside of our field who meet me, um, it's like, I have this image like, oh my God, like what a great speech therapist she's just just like kids with autism I could see that you know I could see people like seeing this like um like you know like California girl like the blonde hair you got like a little boho um little wrap on and like you know more power to you though you know but still like and this is about like also female empowerment right right we are business owners and that you have to know the value of your services and you have to charge for that value. And there's, it doesn't make you less of a human because you're charging, right? You know, the value of your expertise and your knowledge and what uh, the, you know, when you do consulting, how, how important that is to train everybody and that you should be compensated for your time and knowledge. And just as the, the families are benefiting also. So it's a win-win. Totally. And I feel like one thing, cause, cause I think again, like we apologize for charging for things sometimes. Like we feel this level of guilt, like, Oh my God, like, yeah. I just want to give the information away, but like, I feel bad charging. And it's like, the reality is like, if you don't charge for what you do, you can't do it. Like you get, right. you get to a point where you're too burnt out that you can't continue. And so it's like, you need to, to collect money from people so that you can keep doing it and growing it and, and making an impact. Um, and so when you try to, you know, I, I, I've shifted my mindset very early on in business to remember that, like, if I can't charge enough to make enough, I can't do it. Exactly. And so I think when you think through that lens, it's like, oh, like, you're right. Like if I have a private practice, but I don't charge enough to, you know, make a good living, I'm going to stop my private practice and go back to working in the schools, <laughs> you know? So right. it's like, okay, like I need to charge in order to make a living and do what I, what I do best. Exactly. And there's no harm in that, right? There's no shame in that. No shame in your game. Good girl. <laughs> I like that. That's right. <laughs> so how about since I'm i I'm a New Yorker, I've been to California once. Uh, I've thought about moving there and never really followed through with it. But what would you say is the best part of living in California? Great or question. West Coast, um, you know, if you don't want it. To, I know now it's hard because it's a pandemic, but yeah. Well, I will say, I, I mean, I think it's so like, you know, cliche, but it's the weather. Like people okay. flock to the West Coast because we have amazing weather and lots of really great outdoor activities, which you, you can find on the East Coast, but like you're always like, you know, beholden to whatever the weather decides to do. Like, oh, it's going to rain. Like we can't go. Oh, it's actually freezing. We can't go. It's actually too hot and humid. We can't go, (laughs) you know? And so I feel like the weather, um, it's just like pretty moderate all year round. It's not humid. Um, and so that allows me to do what I love doing the most, which is being outside hiking, camping, swimming, biking, you know, you name it. I love doing all those things. And so, um, that is like definitely the, the biggest draw to the West coast, in my opinion. I hear you today in New York. It's, it was six, it is 66 degrees. So the minute I got out of work, I'm like, I am going rollerblading. Like that is my priority. Do you rollerblade? I, you know, it's so funny. It's on my bucket list. It's been on my bucket list. There's these really, um, there's this really awesome group of people. So I live in Venice beach. Um, Hmm. there's this really group, a really great group of people on Sundays. They like play amazing music and they have this like like roller, like blading, roller skating, like dance party. And I'm always like, those people are so awesome. Like, I want to be their friend. I need to lace up some type of like roller skate or roller blade and like go hang with them. Um, so anyway, it's on totally. my bucket list. I haven't, right. I haven't actually done it yet, but now I feel like I'm motivated, Maria. I'm going to send you like a selfie of me, like, you know, like roller blading on, on the Venice boardwalk. <laughs> I would love that. I would appreciate that selfie. Um, so my dog is barking. Let me just one moment. Totally fine. (laughs) It's because I think it's 
probably because my fiance Sal is home. Makes sense. All right, you took them out. Oh, Deb is trying to come in. She finished with her client. This is Yay. perfect timing. We'll go right into the questions with her here. Great. Awesome. Yeah. Hey. Hello. Hi. Hi, What's everybody. Up? Sorry to join the party late. No worries. No worries. I started it late as my life goes. Oh, that's so unusual of you, Maria. I've never known you to not be prompt. It's, my school <laughs> is... My school is remote tomorrow. So I was like, oh, let me get my dog and stuff. And then I had to drop something off my grandparents house because I wasn't going to see them tomorrow. So it's just that's why. But those like minutes, they add up. But anyway, this is actually really good timing because we just did our icebreaker and then we can go into our questions now. Sweet. I am going to lay back and relax and listen and chat because this baby does not want me to sit up straight. <laughs> okay, don't. don't lay back, girl. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I'll just start the, um, the episode like this. And all right. So now Deb just joined us. So say hey, Deb. Hey, Deb. <laughs> How you feeling today, <laughs> Deb? I'm good. I'm a little uncomfortable, but yeah. I'm very excited to learn from Rachel and get all this information. So I'm happy that I was able to join in on this conversation. Yes, I'm excited to have Rachel. We're calling this Real Talk AAC. So my first question Sweet. for Rachel is, how did your passion for AAC begin? Great question. Um, I always tell the story that I actually, in graduate school, I was in a classroom with some colleagues from my program and um, we were observing preschoolers. And they, one of my like colleagues had said, oh, like, and these children were all not really speaking verbally. And one of my colleagues was like, oh, I think we should like do AAC with these kids or like pictures. And I literally was like, why would we do that? <laughs> why would we use pictures? <laughs> like we're right. speech therapists. Like we need to teach kids how to talk. Like, hello. <laughs> right. So like, it's so ironic that like now I do what I do because I'm like, wow, like I was the clinician that I now hope to train <laughs> to know mm -hmm. better. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, my passion really just came out of necessity. I was working in um, schools and I was working with a, a, a lot of children with autism who were not making progress with verbal speech. Um, I was trying everything I could to get them to imitate, just to, to imitate just actions. And it's just, I kept hitting a wall. And so I was like, there has to be another way, um, introduced some low tech uh, visual supports and, and pictures. And then I was like, okay, but like, this isn't enough words. Like this isn't enough. And then I got really interested in high tech AAC and the, realized the power of it, especially um, I specialize in kids with autism. So um, knowing like how powerful, you know, high tech AAC especially has been for kids, even with verbal speech, um, who just don't have a lot of functional communication skills. Um, I was like sold. And then like, once I'm like, I have an idea in my head or I'm like, oh, this is great. I just go down like rabbit holes of like research. And I was just like consuming as much as I can. I went to every training. I like, you know, read every like blog post on practical AAC. Um, and so that's kind of how it started. And now I'm just super passionate about it and giving kids access to, to communication is something that I feel really strongly about. And so my platform, you know, online and even my private practice in LA, I'm just like really passionate about like making sure clinicians and teachers and educators and parents, like everybody understands, like, you know, there's no prerequisites to AAC and like, we can get kids started and making progress really quickly. That's great. That's amazing. I like that. I heard you say that on your podcast, that there are no prerequisites to AAC. So she said it here again, folks. And then also I, on I your podcast, you were talking about giving credit where credit is due your latest episode. And so, yes. so Rachel Madel said it on this SLP <laughs> one and she's podcast. Here it is. All right. Thank you for attributing me for this. <laughs> um, it's crazy. Cause I feel like 
how many times do I need to say like there are no prerequisites for AAC? And I just did a like an Instagram takeover with um, Mrs. Speechy P, um, Andy Putt, and like again, I was just fielding so many questions. But like, what if they don't have joint attention? But like, what if they don't? I'm like, no, no prerequisites means no prerequisites. Like, I don't know how many different ways to say this. Um, but it just goes to show that like, we need to keep saying it over and over again, um, just because I think there's a lot of myths out there about AAC and when it should be introduced. So when people say that there is a roadblock, um, you're just saying that that doesn't mean you don't do AAC. That just means you do AAC and you continue trying using AAC. Totally. And, okay. Yeah. Got it. So, so yeah. basically what happens is like we introduce AAC and if kids don't show us immediately that they can use it all of a sudden everyone's like, no, nope, they're not ready. Like, no, nope, yeah. they can't do it. And so, you know, part of it is like kids learn how to use AAC by actually like getting a chance to use it and us showing them how to use it and us being patient for them to learn how to use it. And so I think that that is a common misconception. Um, you know, people will say, oh, like they need joint attention or like they need certain cognitive skills. They need to be able to visually discriminate. Like all of these like ideas about what kids need in order to be successful with AAC, when the reality is you can learn those skills through AAC. Like kids will learn how to visually discriminate a device by actually having a device to learn how to visually discriminate. Um, and so it's just the fallacy that like we need to have these certain skill sets in order to have AAC. And then what happens is like we have these clinicians who are waiting for these kids to hit these prerequisites and then those prerequisites never happen. And then what are we left with kids who don't have access to communication? Mm -hmm. So it's just this like vicious cycle that just needs to, needs to be stopped. <laughs> All right. I hear that. I actually have a question about, um, the joint attention. So like, let's say this, they have a student that they have poor joint attention. Um, they're, let's say like their eyes are closed and they're like, kind of like, you know, like low muscle tone, they're like flopped over. So do you have any tips of like, how would you incorporate a AAC with that student? Like, would you maybe do like a low tech or do you try high tech right away? Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. do you try to like, do maybe more like sensory to wake them up? Just kind of curious your, your perspective on that. Yeah. So, I mean, first things first, like we need to try, you mentioned sensory Maria, we need to try to make sure, make sure kids are ready to learn. Right. So that's yes. like step number one, our kids ready to learn. Can we regulate their sensory systems? Can we make sure that like all of their basic, you know, needs are met? Like they're not too hungry. They're not too thirsty. They're not too tired. Um, Cause sometimes, you know, it's, it's hard. Like we have huge caseloads. We're trying to do a lot of things. It's like, we don't always have time to do all these things, but if we're going to put a device in front of a student and try to assess whether or not it's working, like those fundamental needs need to be met. So like, that's mm -hmm. like starting off, just making sure that like we're set up and ready to learn. Um, the next thing is finding something that's highly, highly motivating. So mm -hmm. I ask families, what is the, like the one thing that your kid is the most excited about? Like you pull it out or you say, we're going to go on the swing or whatever it might be. It could be mm -hmm. food. It could be a toy. It could be sensory input. Like what is the one thing? And that's the one thing that I use to start mm -hmm. off. Cause the first skill that needs to be taught is initiation right? Like this like device or low tech or whatever it might be is this awesome thing that's going to get you something right away, something that you really like. And so if you make it fun and engaging, then kids are more likely to do it. But what I see is oftentimes like we're just like kind of randomly selecting vocabulary or like, oh, like teachers said they like crowns, like maybe we'll do some coloring. And then it's like kids aren't into it, but then we take that as like, oh, they can't do it. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I whip out like M&Ms or something that like we know kids are going to go crazy out after. And then all of a sudden kids showing us they can use a device. And so I what that you. shows me is that they weren't motivated. Um, so the first step is just like, find something that's highly motivating and it doesn't always align with like academic goals. Is part I of was the just going to say that. So like, I can just picture like me being like, I'm going to use M&Ms in speech. And then like, I'll go and drop, let's say work with a teacher and like the teacher can't be given M&Ms all day long. And like, I understand that teacher's perspective too. So I'm like, I know, like, can you do a token board and they get it at the end, you know, or like, can they work for it after they're done or like every three pages, give them one M&M. So like I do, understand like the teachers have their pressure and they have to work on the IEP goals and they have to do like you know wh questions and assessments and it's like nobody has time for m&ms all day you know <laughs> like 
Totally agree. <laughs> totally. And I, and I hear you and I don't even like, I don't even like using food reinforcers. Like yes, that's not I know. like my jam, yeah, I know. but, but like, if we need to teach kids the power of their words, if it's their jam, words, if that's yeah. their jam, I'm the, my jam is their jam. What you're into, <laughs> I'm into, you know? And we're also talking about like the initial start of AAC, what it, yes. not the like consistent yes. use of it. So it's like, if we need like a couple m ms to jump start something, then I don't right. see the harm in that. I right. know it's all like, oh, food, blah, but- and sometimes, like you said, Deb, it's like, we need, we need everybody to, to buy in. Like, wow, look, he found the M&Ms. Wow, we moved it. He still found it. Wow, he's navigating three folders to get to the M&Ms. It's like, yeah. we need that buy-in. So everyone's like, cool, right. this device is going to be great. Um, you know, we can't stay there forever, but right. we have to start there. Because if we start with something that's not motivating, kids are like, don't care. Like, don't right. care what color it is, or don't care what number that is or don't care what letter that is and so there's no faster way to get a kid disinterested in AAC and communicating than to just make it super academic and boring um so start with something highly motivating get buy-in so the kids like M&M 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 and then we move on and we expand outside mm -hmm. of perhaps the highly highly motivating because they we've taught them like your words have power when you say things things happen. Like you get M&Ms right. or you get to go to the swing or you can say you're all done and you could be done that task. Um, and so I think that we start with highly motivating and then we can start, you know, expanding out of that once kids show us that like they understand the function of the AAC system. Right. And I think what's important, what Rachel said is that, so she said that the child's now navigating three folders to find the M&Ms. So she's not using this as an example of like, ask for Legos, get an M&M. She is saying, if you want M&Ms, you'll find that icon that directly says M&Ms, and then you will then in turn receive M&Ms. So it's not a reward. This is something that I did not know right away in early in my career. Yes. That is completely a great point. <laughs> we yeah, want it nice to be a direct to... correlation. Like I said, yeah. M&Ms, I got M&Ms. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And so that's, that's something that's yeah really important to remember because we can't, it, it confuses things. Yeah. When, like I said, Lego, cause you were trying to get me to say what it is. And then I got an M&M and right. so like, keep it simple simple, like get kids asking for the things that they want, uh, mm -hmm. before you start working on labeling and things like that, that kids might not be as interested in. Um, uh, the other thing that's really, um, really great when you're working with a student who you're like, Oh, they're not really showing me that they can use this or it's not consistent. Um, try snapping a photo of that thing. Um, assuming it's a thing, maybe it's like some type of activity or verb, but most of the time it's like some type of like tangible item. Mm -hmm. And so um, sometimes kids take a, a little bit of time to understand symbolic representation. So this idea that like this symbol represents M&Ms. So M&Ms don't look like M&Ms. They're just like three little circles, right? So they mm -hmm. represent M&Ms. Um, so sometimes what I'll do for kids who are not showing consistently activating, um, I'll snap a photo. Like here's the exact photo of the exact M&Ms that you will receive when we like say right. m &Ms. Mm -hmm. um, so that can be a hack that can be really helpful is taking photos. We don't want to get stuck there because the reason we have symbols is because when we ask for cookie, we don't want to have to program Chips Ahoy, Oreo, Teddy Grahams, like right. all of those things. We don't have enough space. We want some symbol that represents cookie, right? right. Um, but it can be enough for sometimes getting kids started and really like using the system with more accuracy and intention if we take photos. I like that because sometimes they need that actual photo. I hear you done that before just taking photos of random things like a garfield massager just like pictures of my phone like random garfield massager toys <laughs> stuff like that yep. so i have a question about so like if you have a student and they just want to you start a device so you're just like trialing it and they just want to like push all the buttons and they like you know and then they like play the long sentences like da -da 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 -da. it's like all the animals they go to the animal folders so I'm like, do you have any advice of like what to do with that? Cause it's like, all right. Then I eventually have to like redirect them or just like take this device and like, I don't even know, like hide some of the symbols, like, I, or if it's like, if it's their first time starting out, do you want them to just kind of like explore it? And then at another time I'm like, are they exploring it? Or are they just like engaging in self-stimulatory behavior? Cause they like how it sounds. 
Yeah, this is a really like common question that a lot of clinicians oh, okay. feel stuck on because and, and parents too, because they're like, uh, it seems like they're just like playing around with it, not using yeah. it. It's like a toy. Right. Um, so mm-hmm. there's a few things that I tell parents like that um that say that, which is one, like we whenever we introduce something new, like of course kids are gonna explore it. So they're like, what is this? I'm not really sure. Let me push the button, hear the word, push the button, hear the word. I've actually had students who seem as if they're stimming all day long, but what they've actually done is memorize where every single word is on their device. Now we still need to work with these kids and teach them, you know, to understand the words they're using to to make a meaningful experience out of the words that they're using. But I've worked with kids who like, it was this huge problem and ABA was like, we need to extinguish this behavior and all these things. And I'm like, let's just give it a little bit of time. And with this student I'm thinking about, I can be like, you know, unicorn. And they're like, bam, 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 unicorn. (laughs) And I can be like tree. And they're like, bam, 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 tree. So like they literally used that as a way to learn where the words are on their system. Um, You know, the same way that babies babble to explore their speech sounds and make words. Um, You know, the way that babies learn language is by babbling and us attributing meaning to the the sounds that they're making. So they're like, bah, bah. And we're like, yes, that is a baby. Right? right? We're just assuming mm-hmm. they're saying baby because the baby's on the bed and they said baba, right? The same way we can do that with our AAC learners. Um, they say a word. We don't have cookies right now. We have crackers though, right? right. Instead of saying like, no, no, like I'm holding up the, the crackers. You can't be saying cookie. It's not a cookie. We, we right. automatically try to correct instead yeah. of attributing meaning the same way we do with babies who are learning language. Um, it's mm-hmm. the same thing. I got another carb for you. I got a cracker. I got some Ritz, you know, pick another carb. Yeah, we got lots of carbs. Lots Choose of carbs. your carb. <laughs> yeah. And that, and I feel like a lot of times when I have a student, I'm trying a device with them. And let's say, well, like if they go back to the classroom and they have the device and then the teacher's like, Maria, you know, all they want to do is like, just go into the animals. And I'm just like, ah, like, and I feel bad for the teachers too. Cause I don't want to And sometimes they might like, you know, like take the device away or they might like have to like clear it and just be like, all right, but now we have to go back to the lesson. So do you recommend like in that case when they're like pushing all the buttons, but there's like a lesson to be done? Like, do you recommend to like redirect them in a way? I'm just wondering any tips you have for situations like that. Okay. Yeah. I just like wrote a bunch down because I'm like, let me say all these things. Um, Okay, so there's a few technical things. Let's go over really quickly. So one, the message window. We can typically with a lot of devices auto clear the message window. So it doesn't just collect tons and tons of words and then we hit it and it's like, oh my (laughs) God, it's like a 45 word sentence. (laughs) Um, So yes, we can can The other kids are like, what's going on? The parents are laughing. Like, what did that just say? And I'm just like, I I can't like, please. (laughs) please. I, I can't, yes. like, you know, we've, like, we've all had that experience all, where you're like, and it's like cookie, 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 more cookie, cookie, cookie. And you're like, Oh my God, how do I make it stop? Yeah. <laughs> so yes, you can definitely change the interaction settings too. So like, um, on a lot of systems, um, you can do, um, you can change the interaction so that when you hit the button, you have to wait at least a half a second or a second before it will reactivate. So that's another, like if kids are rapid. Oh, yes. You showed me this at ASHA and I did it to my kid's device as soon as I got home. Yes. <laughs> that can be a game changer. You also yeah. can change it so that you actually have to press down for more time. So mm-hmm. you have to hold on to it in order for it to activate. So playing around with settings like that can just like help minimize the ease in which kids are like rapid fire hitting all the buttons and hearing all the sounds. Um, the other thing is the... Um, I mean, there are some features where you're able to like, like I'm thinking of Proloquo to go as an example. Um, I would never recommend taking any words off of a device because that like just leads to frustration. And also like, who are we to take words away? Like just because we, we have the power to do that doesn't mean that we should. Um, in extreme situations, um, you can uh, dim some of the vocabulary. So Proloquo to go is an example of a system where you can, select the button and dim it so it's not able to activate and make a sound but you can still see when kids are hitting it um okay so that's still that helpful be, i've i've used that in like an extreme situation where like aba is like we're taking the words off and i'm like let's not take them off like let's yeah. just use this dim feature as like a, a common ground like in the middle um just because like 
imagine if you had cookies last night and you were like, they were so good and I want more. And then you went to your device and you're like, I know they were right here. And like, where the heck are the cookies? Like how much frustration would you have when you were like, I just want to say that I want those cookies. But like parents are like, well, the cookies are gone. So we're just going to take the button off. Like that's not the way that it works. Uh, Yeah. I've taken off two words before beer and wine. It was in lamp under beverages. So I'm like, I'm going to, I'm going to take these off. He's eight. Even if he wanted to drink beer and wine, he really shouldn't. So I'm going to take off those two. So hopefully you agree with take removing those words. Listen, I mean, I would definitely want those on my system if I was right. an AC user. But, but <laughs> <laughs> and I think, and I think, just having a team discussion too. So, like, okay. I'm not of the mentality that like I just come in and tell people what to do and what not to do. Like, yes, I there's a few hard and fast rules that I try to like remind everyone of, but. The reality is like things come up and you have to work as a team to collaborate and figure out like, what are we going to do? We have this problem. Like, how do we solve this? Um, and so I think, you know, when you come together and it's a team decision, it's more likely everyone's more bought into the process. Cause they're like, Oh, I had a say in this decision instead of like somebody coming in and just saying like, no, do this, follow my, follow my recommendation, you know? Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. It's also hard to work collaborative collaboratively when one person is like kind of strong arming or taking like a very strong lead because then it feels like everyone wants to defer to this one decision maker as opposed to like things being a collaborative effort and like being able to be an active participant in this child's education. So I think that's an important part. No, and that's like hard because like sometimes you have really strong um, mm-hmm. personalities within teams. And yeah. like I found that, you know, making sure that if I, sometimes I go into to IEP meetings and, um, you know, just the private practitioner that's there to like share input. Um, but like making sure that I ask questions to other people, like, cause those people tend to like overtake conversations and right. I'm like, we heard what you want, Sherry, like, <laughs> exactly. like you make sure that we like, you know, it's a round table discussion. OT, what do you yeah. think? ABA, what do you think? Teacher, parents, like, you know, so like I've gone into situations even when like, I'm not leading the team, but I'm like really curious to hear what so-and-so thinks right. um, yeah. as a way to like share the mic, you know? Definitely. Definitely. So do you have uh, any tips maybe for teachers on how they can incorporate the device into their lessons? Like I've used the example of like you can use go for turning the page like anytime you need something to go right even like go to the bathroom so like have them hit go or bathroom before they leave so like that's like one little tip I will share with teachers I don't know if you have another one Absolutely. So part of part of the mindset we need to get into when we're thinking about supporting teachers is teachers have a lot on their plate. Teachers have a whole classroom full of kids that they're trying to teach and manage. And so when we're going in, um, and actually I just talked about this, I was on our podcast talking about this. Um, we had an episode with this woman, her name's Carly Hines. She's a, a teacher, uh, a special education teacher based out of the UK. And she said this to me years ago and it's always stuck. And she was like, SLP is always trying to come in talking about one kid, but I have a whole classroom full of kids. So like <laughs> she, she said it in a way that was like, can you support me with all of my students? Can you integrate into what I'm doing so that all of my kids benefit, not just the one kid you're working with who has an IEP? Um, And so I've taken that to heart and I've kind of shifted the way that I practice now um, and really talking to teachers and and getting clear on like, how can I help support what you're already doing? Mm Because I think we have these goals as SLPs. We're trying to come in, we're trying to do core words and follow our goals. And so, you know, we try to kind of put that on our teachers and say like, Hey, like we're trying to build out core words. Can you, you know, do this core word in this routine instead of saying, okay, like what are some like routines that are happening every single day where you feel like it's possible to incorporate the device? Like here's some ideas, Mm -hmm. you know, saying go every time you go outside or, you know, making it again, a collaboration. Um, If you can, if you can help solve a problem for a teacher, you've got immediate trust and rapport. It, and and that's what you need in order to actually make long-term, you know, goals and successes. Um, you need to be the person that they're like, oh, thank God Rachel's here. She's here to help. Right. Oh, Instead yeah. of, oh, Rachel's here, like more work. No, I don't oh, want to do this. You know, it's the core word lady. Like now she's going to ask me. 
exactly. Where my binders Cor- are. She, uh, <laughs> lady, just keep walking. Forward Nazi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Yeah, no, that's that's important too. And even with parents too, right? Like, what are your routines already? What are you already doing? All right, meal time, right? So, like, how can you incorporate the device during meal time? Let's say something yeah. that's all they're already doing. I'm not trying to make your life more difficult. I'm trying to facilitate communication, aka make it easier. <laughs> Totally. And also, um, one of my favorite questions to ask parents is what is your favorite time of the day with your child? Because that sometimes sometimes what we do is we're like, so routines based that we're like mealtime dressing. And it's like, kids might not want to talk about getting dressed. Like they might actually hate getting dressed. So like, if we're trying to like embed activities into getting dressed, like right. it, it, we might hit a wall, right? It, right. It, it might feel like work versus what's your favorite time of day? How can I weave communication into something you're already doing and loving with your child? Because you're more likely to have a motivating experience and that's more likely to translate into more communication. And so a- automatically you have a situation where parents excited because it doesn't feel like extra work. It actually feels like they're connecting better with their child. And um, kids are really motivated because it's a routine that they hopefully love and enjoy. Um, and so that's something that's like an easy kind of launching off pad. Um, eventually we need to integrate language into getting dressed and meal time and all those things. Um, but again, start with something that's really motivating, build those small successes over time. And then we can branch out into other routines that are maybe not as motivating as, you know, that one time a day that you're with your child. Definitely. Yeah, that, that makes so much sense because a parent might be like, I'm just trying to get like an arm through a sleeve. Like I can yeah. also do this device. And it is, it's so hard to just like break out of that box of routine and um, strategy where you're just like, well, what's the most cookie cutter way to utilize this device? Like there's a bunch of pictures of clothes. There's a bunch of pictures of food. There's a bunch of pictures of school supplies. So like, and I love that idea of, of asking the parent what time of day they like, because maybe they're just sitting nice and they can just have the device and model something like, you know, more paint. Yeah. I, like, I like that. That's my I'm really big on with device. Like if we're past requesting, which they get requesting right away. And like you said, they like it. They want it. They're going to ask for it. They will find a way and they they gain that skill pretty easily for the most part or quickly because they are motivated so what about commenting what about I like that you're like we're reading a book like hey do you like uh, elephants like I like elephants yeah I like that what about you do you or no I don't like that no you know okay turn the page just like commenting commenting's a big one (laughs) yeah so I have another so I'm here for a short window I gotta leave now because I have another kid so thanks for letting me learn from you. And I look forward to hearing this entire episode. Peace awesome. out, thanks, Deb. Deb. Bye. <laughs> so I have just two more questions for you, Rachel. Um, so okay. if you have any advice for kids with um, the poor finger strength and maybe they can't push the buttons um, or if like they don't even like, you know, hold a pencil or they're like gripping. So I'm just, I know you're not, an occupational therapist, but you know, I'm sure you work closely with them. So if you've seen like any tricks along the way, totally. Yeah. So, um, there's a few things. One is making, um, you can get what are called key guards for a device. Mm -hmm. So basically that's like a plastic overlay that has like each button has like a little frame around it. Mm -hmm. Um, those can be really helpful for kids who are having what are called access issues. They can't access the system by, you know, isolating a finger and touching a button. Um, So key guards can be really helpful to increase that. Um, I will say that kids start off with AAC sometimes with like poor fine motor control. And over time and practice, they improve their fine motor control um, by being, you know, able to see a button, touch a button. Um, I've also used, um, I just recently started doing this like about a year or two ago. There's a, um, it's like a plastic overlay called tack screen. Um, basically what it is, is like this, like the like clear screen that goes on top of an iPad. Um, you can buy it on Amazon. I think it's like 10 bucks, 15 bucks, maybe. Um, and it has like these little bumps. And so it gives some tactile feedback. And so oh. for some kids that actually has been really helpful, um, to just give that input. So that's a strategy that I would use. Um, you know, if, if it's to the point where, 
you know, kids can't just can't access a iPad. Um, we would do other things like tax screen T A C. I'm sorry. I'm like, I hold it up. T A C C tax. Screen. Yeah. Tactile learning screen. Okay. Link is in the yeah. show notes. I found it. Okay. Yep. You found yeah, it. You found, I found it. it. Um, so, so that can be super helpful. Um, if like, if you're having kids that just aren't able to do that, um, and they have like, you know, some type of diagnosis where you're like, okay, they have cerebral palsy or something going on where they're just fine motor is yeah. not ideal. Um, you might look into switches. So like, um, single month, single message, um, you know, are a good place yes. to start for cause and effect, but don't get stuck there. Yes. Um, you can use those switches to activate robust AAC systems. Um, and so I'd recommend looking into, you know, switches and things like that. You also can do what's called partner assisted auditory scanning, um, which is it's partner assisted, meaning you need a communication partner there with a the student. Um, but for kids with severe access issues, that's an option. Yes. Um, and then like there's head tracking where you can put a little dot on a forehead if they have movement of their head, of course, eye gaze and eye tracking. There's lots of things that you can do, um, but just for kids who you think probably can use an iPad, um, just start off with maybe a key guard and also that like tax screen can be helpful. Mm -hmm. um, I also mm -hmm. love there's these books called Polka Dot. So like, yes, um, I have those. Have you, have you seen them? Yeah, yeah I have those them. Are actually really good for isolating a finger and like oh, getting yes. you like touching um, something. Um, and then there's a few iPad games. Actually, I have a resource on my website. Um, it's like an app guide and we can link to that in the show notes. I'll send mm -hmm. it to you. Um, but there's a ton of like cause and effect apps. And I find those are really helpful to just kids get them interacting with screens, learning how to drag and touch and, you know, isolate a finger. Um, so those can be good practice as kids are learning how to activate a screen. I am so happy with all these recommendations because I have some thoughts in my head and I'm like, can't, ex and now I'm excited. Now I'm excited. See this. I'm so glad we had you on the show. Good. And my last and final question is if you have any advice for really just for SLPs, but maybe anyone who's like brand new to this field or, ah, I'm oh, sorry. I had a notification. I'm like, oh no, I lost her, but you're here. Uh, so any advice to SLPs or CFs? Yes. My advice is there's, you're never going to know everything there is to know about AAC. I don't know everything there is to know about AAC and I never will. I don't know every system and feature and I'm still learning every single day. I'm like, oh, wow, I had no idea that app could do that. Or I had no idea, you know, how to do that. So just remember like AAC is really just language therapy. It's mm -hmm. really just, we have a tool to facilitate the language therapy, but it's really just language therapy. Um, Cause I think what happens is, is, you know, clinicians get frozen in fear. Like I'm not an AAC specialist. I don't know right. enough about AAC. Like I can't do this. And so, yes. you know, what I would say to them, and I've said this actually before is like the wrong AAC is better than no AAC. Meaning like start with what you know, because what you're using, that's any form of AAC, whether that's, you know, a core board or, you know, a system that you might be familiar with, that's better than nothing. Sign language, and so don't be right? frozen in fear. Sign language, yes. Start with yes. something because what happens, yes. I'm signing. Um, just because like, yes, we're signing to each other. Because um, I think, again, that, that that's what people, like they freeze and then they don't do anything. And that's the worst thing we can do for these mm -hmm. kids. We need to give access to, you know, communication, ideally robust language systems that have lots of words and right. grammar and typing and all the things. But you know, start with what you know, and just know that you can find the answers. Um, you can search out the information as you're going along. Um, so just like, just remember to just get started. Um, like just that. because we don't want kids sitting and waiting, just like not getting access just because like, we don't know exactly what to do. And there's a lot of type A personalities in the SLP world who are like, I don't know exactly what to do. So I'm not going to do anything. Like, right. Don't do that. Don't do that. Just start somewhere. Start with what's motivating. Uh, to, and also, I think important, like talking to the parents, too, so they know what you're doing to incorporate. Maybe if they don't have a device yet for the home, well, at least they can use the same words that you're trying to do on the device. Right. Like if you're working on more cookie, then, you know, maybe they can sign more cookie or they can exchange mm -hmm. a symbol for that. And thus, like at least your work, there's some like carryover. That's mm -hmm. like, for me, the biggest thing with AAC, like he could do great in the speech room with the device, but if he's not, he or she is not doing it at home and in the classroom. And then that chart, that 
device just sits like in their backpack, then like, I really have done nothing. <laughs> like totally. That's how totally. I feel, you know? Yeah. It, Cause it's just like, you're like in a silo in your therapy room and it's not generalizing to a child's real world existence, which is mm-hmm. the whole point of what we do. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Oh gosh. It's real talk, right? Just get it out there. Real talk. Like, Real talk. And sometimes it's like a little uncomfortable to have these conversations like, Hey, you know, uh, remember that device, uh, you know, have you charged it lately? You know, but like, you have to just like rip the bandaid off and like mm-hmm. have these kind of difficult decisions sometimes. It- and sometimes I'll just be outright with families. Yeah. I'll be like, why are you not using it? <laughs> okay, you're good. You're good. I, I'm, I'm like, so, um, yeah. I'm not really sure. I'm like, what, why are we not using it? And, and, I, and I caveat, the caveat is like, if you're not using it, it's my job to figure out how I can teach you how to use it in a way that feels doable and achievable. Mm-hmm. And so I put it on me. I'm like, That's it's on great. me. And then when I come back and like, say a family hasn't done the at-home practice, it's like, it's my job to figure out at home practice that actually works with you and your family and your schedule. So like, it's not you, like, we just need to keep working at it. Like we'll keep going back to the drawing board and trying to figure out what's going to work and what's going to stick for you. I like that. That's really good. That's you're, you're very brave, Rachel. You go this margarita drinker. I get it. I hear you. I see That's you. right. We're, we're, we're bold. You're bold. <laughs> us, us <tequila> go for <laughs> it. Yeah. So we like to end our episodes with a quote or a mantra, just something to, uh, you know, leave us off with. So if you can share okay. your quote with us, here's my quote. You ready? I'm ready. My quote, my quote is believe they can, because nice. I work with with really, really complex needs, severe disabilities, um, kids that have been told by other clinicians or educators or even parents sometimes don't believe that change is possible. And so if we believe going into a situation or starting to work with a new student, if we believe that communication won't happen, if we believe that AAC won't work for the student, then we'll be right. We'll be right, right every single time because we won't have believed and we won't have done all of, you know, the, the teaching and all the things that we need to do in order to have success. Um, and so I feel like one of the best things we can do as clinicians, especially speech language pathologists who specialize in communication, is to believe that all students are capable of, of communicating. Um, it's just my job to figure out how can we make this happen? How can I introduce the right technology and support, you know, the team in a way that actually moves the needle for kids? Um, but I really do believe that every child is capable of making progress and has the ability to communicate. Um, and so believing that is the first step and then advocating for that belief across the team, because a lot of times parents have lost hope. They have a seven or eight year old who's not speaking and they're just like, we've tried all these things and it's not going to work. And so like, I need to inspire hope that things will change. And then when you inspire that and you get momentum, then all of a sudden you start to see things change. Definitely. Um, You're right about that. Believing believing in students is the first step in anything that we're doing. A hundred percent. I love that. Thank you so much, Rachel. That was so inspiring. I got some goosebumps with that. And I really thank you for your time and your knowledge. And um, thank you so much for being a guest on the show. And next time I'm going to be in California, I'm going to call you and we're going to go rollerblading. We're going to have yes. some margaritas yes. maybe before or after the rollerblading. I don't know. I don't know. We're going to need some pads. We're going to need some elbow pads and knee pads if we're going after. We will. And a helmet, of course. So yes. (laughs) Stay safe. (laughs) Yes. Same to you, Rachel. Thank you so much. Have a good night. And thank you again. Thanks so much.